Did I see Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania? Yes. Did I like Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania? Would I recommend it? Well, let me give you my top of mind reactions and a mini review. I just saw the movie and I have some thoughts. I also will probably have some spoilers. If you're not interested in that, click away. I'm usually not interested in spoilers. And if you're looking for a full-throated positive review, uh, also click away. I was really rooting for this movie, really rooting for it. I'm a Marvel super fan. I cosplay a character from the Ant-Man movies. I loved the first two Ant-Man movies. I thought they were very inventive and fast moving and cool and buoyant. They had a lift to them. Plus the characters felt real, real enough for a Marvel movie and their arcs were very, very satisfying. I even helped promote the movie a little bit by buying the poster, doing some more cosplay. Oh, how I wanted to like Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Well, in my advertising copywriting life, we were taught to start with the positive when you're reacting to an idea or to a finished product. So let's start with the positive. It's beautiful. It looks great. It is a spectacle. You are immersed in this beautiful quantum realm. The digital art is amazing. It is inventive visually. And it looks absolutely amazing. It looks like an aquarium. And I like aquariums. We have a great one here in St. Louis. And it looks like you're in the aquarium, man, with amoeba floating by. So beautiful to look at. For two hours, you're going to be looking at it a lot. It's set almost entirely in the quantum realm. And everybody is trying real hard. They're all acting their hearts out. Was glad to see Michael Douglas, Ant-Man, get to do some action hero stuff. Everybody you see here is giving it their all. But their all isn't enough because the whole movie feels slight. This doesn't feel so much like Ant-Man 3 as Kang Dynasty Zero. It's all one big setup. And in the end, spoiler alert, I'm not sure who won. Did they beat Kang? Did they release Kang? Very ambiguous. Ambiguity in art is good. That much ambiguity in a superhero movie, I'm... I'm not sure. I do fault the script. The whole movie feels to me written. Maybe that's the fault of a director. I'm feeling the script. Nothing feels really genuine. And I don't mean because it's in the quantum realm. I mean, the character beats don't seem real. It's okay. You know, here's the moment in which Scott is finally going to call his daughter, Cassie Peanut. It's like, it's about an hour into the movie and it feels like it's written. Okay. Like here's the part where Scott calls her peanut. And a lot of the lines felt that way to me. They felt written and they felt like placeholders for lines to come. There's a dramatic moment that Michael Douglas gets in the movie where he shows up to help save the day. And his line is, Sorry, I'm late. That felt like a placeholder for some <laughs> better, more clever, more surprising line that wasn't there. And a lot of the lines felt that way to me. It's like, well, the script says, I say this sort of meta thing, because it is very meta. The script sort of knows that it's about itself. It's like all the throwbacks to Ant-Man 1 and 2 are supposed to get you charged up, but they just feel written. The movie relies on borrowed equity, borrowed equity. We love Ant-Man 1, and we love Ant-Man and the Wasp, and the movie assumes we're going to love this one the way we love those, just because, just because we say peanut, just because some of the running gags are back, 
et cetera, et cetera. It's sort of, if you liked those two, you'll love this. Well, no, this is a completely different kettle of ants. You mean Janet Van Dyne, Michelle Pfeiffer, who also is acting her heart out, was in the quantum realm for 30 years, had all this experience with freedom fighters and Kang and a, a whole life and never mentioned it to her family. The conceit of the writer and of the movie is that nobody knows any of these things. She had a lover down there, ostensibly, the Bill Murray character. And, you know, this whole life. And as it's revealed, Michael Douglas as Hank just kind of is stoic. He sort of takes it in. It's like, oh, you did, did you? It's not even that much. It's like, why didn't you ever tell me about this? Yeah, like, what? Why didn't you ever tell me about this? That's an unearned moment as well. Yes, they could all go down in the quantum realm, but so much happens with characters that we've never seen before that have no equity in that regard, the way other Marvel characters might. It's like, oh, there's Batroc the Leaper. Ah, that is true for Modoc. The moments just keep coming. I know it's called quantum mania, but mania is not story. It's just a whole bunch of stuff happening. You never feel genuinely scared for the characters. You never feel triumphant for the characters. And it, it, it's like in a loop. Cassie and Modoc have a showdown twice. I think it's the same showdown. She's on a ledge. He's coming for her. She gets away. And then a few minutes later... She's on a ledge. Modoc's coming for her. Kang is ultimately confusing to me. Kang himself. I will admit that Kang has always been confusing to me. I used to read him in Marvel Comics quite a lot, and I cannot follow his story at all. I know he's Rama Tutti, something to do with Doctor Doom. He's other characters as well. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what he's about. Why did he go to the quantum realm? Why did he want to get out? Why not let him out? What's at stake? With Thanos, the previous big bad in the Marvel movies, we knew what he wanted. Love him, hate him, hate him a lot. Even civilians who watch Marvel movies know what Thanos wanted and know what threat he is. Thanos wanted half of life gone so that the other half could thrive ostensibly. Hence the snap, hence the blip, et cetera, et cetera. Audiences got that suspension of disbelief. It's a superhero, big villain. So with Kang, what does he want? What, where is he going? Why is he a threat? Uh, leave me a comment. Could somebody explain Kang to me? <laughs> yeah, the movie feels like Ant-Man fan fiction. It feels as if someone who really loved the first two movies drank a lot of coffee and blasted out. It's, it feels like a first draft to me. A lot of it also feels like it's on a soundstage. That's okay. Mo these movies have to be shot on a soundstage, but I kept seeing the set. It's like, well, this is this is on the soundstage. Beautiful. Now, the previous Ant-Man movies were no doubt set on a soundstage as well, but they looked naturalistic to me. That all looks very cool. I'm sure it was shot on a soundstage. This one is like, despite all the CGI and the millions of things happening and the soldiers and the rebellion and the anti-rebellion and the stuff happening, it looks like, Hey, look at that set. Really nice set. In the end, I guess my biggest criticism, and I'm so sorry to have so many, is that it was kind of boring. About halfway through, my wife and I we were both looking at our watches. It's like, whew, it's because you're in the aquarium. It's like, wow, look at all the things happening in the aquarium. But even in the aquarium, you go, let's go to the other part of the aquarium or let's stop and go to the gift shop have marvel movies jumped the shark i won't go that far i'm not a fatalist but 
if they proceed, we need the Russo brothers back or Joe Johnson, who directed Captain America, the first Avenger, the Marvel movies from the Russo brothers, the Civil War, your end game, et cetera. They felt like they had gravitas and momentum. And when I say reality, the reality of a Marvel movie where you really care what's happening and there's a naturalism to the story that you can really drop yourself into, follow, cheer, boo, et cetera, et cetera, really immerse yourself in the story, not in the mania. Those are my first reactions. Of course, I'll watch it again. Maybe I'll have a more nuanced understanding and appreciation for it. We need an Ant-Man 3, though, now. We need the third story of the trilogy, not the preface to whatever this Phase 5 is going to be. You know, my wife and I went to a Van Gogh virtual 3D exhibit. It was traveling around the country. Maybe you've seen it, too. And when you go in, Van Gogh paintings are moving across walls and they're, the colors are moving over your skin. And it's like, wow, it's Van Gogh, man. It's like that was the quantum realm. It's like the colors and shapes. But all of a sudden, so much is happening and none of it really seemed to matter. Sorry to be so critical. I'm a Marvel super fan. I think I'll go watch Ant-Man 1 and Ant-Man the Wasp 2 again. Oh, the Wasp. She's in the title. What does she have to do in this movie? She shows up a few times and gets off a few blasts. But I don't understand her story arc. I was like, why is she a hero? What? <laughs> They're all great to look at. They all look terrific, don't they? The casting is terrific. I thought they were all, like I said, acting their hearts out. And I'm going to go watch them act their hearts out in those first two movies. Thank you for letting me vent. I'll be very interested in your comments below. You can set me straight on a few things. And know that this is my top of mind reaction. But that's usually my reaction. I do have some movies I love, too. I recently saw a Michael Douglas movie from the 90s I had never seen before, Falling Down. Oh my gosh. There's so much going on with it in its heart, in its head, in its structure, in its conflicts, in its tension. <laughs> I want to talk about Falling Down, Michael Douglas, 1993. Look it up, watch it. It's not an easy watch. It's pretty chilling in places. It was sort of the Breaking Bad and Pulp Fiction before Breaking Bad and Pulp Fiction, but I digress. As you can see, I much prefer to talk about movies that I love. Next review, a movie I love. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Wow, Marvel. I'll be there for you for Phase 5, but be there for me. Thanks for watching Walt Now Cosplay and Comics. I'm Walt Now. <music>